Jane Wales of the Aspen Institute and the Global Philanthropy Forum. I just want to welcome you here so bright and early. We worried that uh, valuation would not be a great draw, so Lee was extremely pleased to see that there was a sign out here this morning to say that this session's on imagination. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who think it's on imagination, don't leave, we'll weave it in uh, somehow. Um, let me just make a, a, a two or three or three or four key points about evaluation, just so that we're, we're we're sure we're talking about the same thing plus imagination, and that is that when when we think about evaluation, we think about three different kinds of activity. Um, there's there's monitoring performance, there's tracking progress, and then there's there's assessing impact, and so. You may be hearing some of our speakers talking about different, different activities, these three different activities, within the context of the larger, of the larger um, evaluation world. The, the second is just that, that purpose matters. And a lot of the things we'll be talking about will come back to purpose. Is your, is your I mean, I think for a long time, folks have, have gathered as much evidence as they could and sort of in search of, of, or gathered as much information as they could in search of evidence of impact. Um, and that, that is very burdensome on both grantee and grantor. And so as it, increasingly folks are arguing that uh, information should be gathered and, and organized around decisions. So around the decisions of, of the grantee, around the decisions of the grantor. And there are some foundations that feel one should go further. And that is to have as one of the purposes the, the informing of the field writ large. So, so it's informing decision making and it's advancing field-wide learning for, for many. Um, the third point I'd make is that the cost-benefit uh, ratio matters, uh, that matching the evaluation method to the, uh, to the undertaking and thinking through the costs and on whom those costs, uh, that burden falls, uh, is important. And that foundations that are asking a lot of their grantees with respect to evaluation should be willing to finance that, the, the cost of the valuation. Uh, unit of analysis matters. It matters whether you're talking about at the level of a foundation strategy, which Mayer will talk a lot about, whether you're talking about the level of a foundation initiative, you know, a, a set of activities around a goal, or whether you're talking about the evaluation of, of the grantee. Um, and I would just note that, that increasingly foundations are concluding that beneficiary feedback matters. Uh, don't this, just let this be a conversation within the foundation or between the foundation and a grantee without thinking about who's the long-term beneficiary and are they saying something works uh, or doesn't. And then finally, I just make the point that for those who are concerned about advancing field-wide learning, and I hope more and more will be, is that transparency matters. And so we'll talk a little bit about how do you seize that opportunity to share the knowledge you've generated and gathered uh, in, in a sensible way, but also a practical way, a way that, that, that really makes makes uh, information uh, usable uh, and translatable into knowledge. I'm going to start out the panel with Lee Shore, uh, who is a remarkable leader in this, in this field. Um, she's a senior fellow um, at the uh, Center for Study and Social Policy. She's a lecturer at Harvard uh, in social medicine. She founded the Pathways uh, and Mapping Initiative uh, is the author of two books and is really a nation, a national expert in the whole question of, in, in the issue of how do you go about advancing social programs uh, uh, that themselves are aimed at improving the futures of, of, uh, of children, uh, disadvantaged children, of families, and of communities. So we'll open up with Lee. Thank you, Jane. I have to start by saying I really love the name of this session evaluating and learning for greater impact. You're not asking for better evaluation and learning just to minimize risk, uh, to show off fancy metrics. You actually are interested in evaluation and learning to achieve greater impact. And that, I think, is very, very basic and not true of everybody who talks about evaluation. Um, 
You're asking what kind of evidence we need to achieve greater results. Uh, and I'd like to think that the title suggests that you might be more interested in learning than in proving. Um, now, we decided that I'd talk a little bit about the evolution of evidence and evaluation. When I started in the social policy field, which was very long ago, in the mid-1960s, it was a time when having a good idea and a champion and good intentions was often quite enough to get funding. And of course, that era did not last. Uh, calls for hard evidence of effectiveness grew throughout the 80s and 90s. And social scientists who were aspiring to the same kind of exactitude as their biological brethren uh, developed randomized experiments to assess social programs and policies, especially those social programs and policies whose effectiveness was suspect. And that certainly included programs for the poor. It also included uh, international development programs. So whatever wasn't quite, where we weren't quite agreed that this was a good way to spend either philanthropic or public money, those were the ones that were assigned to the social scientists to start to evaluate rigorously. And then legislate, legis, legislators began to mandate the use of <coughs> control groups and experimental design as a condition of funding. Web-based clearinghouses began to appear that had lists of proven programs. Now, early in the Obama administration, OMB took the lead in establishing a climate in which evidence would play an ever larger role. And that was welcomed by a lot of people, and rightly so, because we hadn't used enough evidence in all of our decision making. Um, now, what happened in some circles may turn out to be too much of a good thing. We may have taken that too far in demanding randomized trials to do more than <clears throat> assessing powerful drugs, which were, after all, standardized. And we started applying it to social programs and social policies, some of which could be standardized, but some of which, when standardized, were going to be a lot less effective if they weren't going to change from site to site if they weren't going to change as people learned more, as the research grew, as the experience from practice grew. Uh, so the, um, I am not sure and would love to know what you all think about to what extent it was OMB's lead that got a lot of the larger foundations to aspire to the same kind of rigor, or whether it was a general climate, but um, the smaller foundations and the venture capitalist social entrepreneurs did not jump aboard that bandwagon in the same way. Uh, Bridgespan, Daniel Stitt at Bridgespan did a survey of the grantees of uh, the Social Innovation Foundation and ask them, how much pressure do you get to have randomized trials as your evidence? And found that the, that the pressures from the feds was the greatest, from the large foundations was next, and from the social entrepreneurs and the venture capitalists was the least. 
which is very, very interesting in this group <coughs> where, um, where the latter are more represented than the former. Now, I think wherever you stand on this, uh, we have to make sure that the work we pr promote is indeed informed by evidence, while at the same time striving for greater impact by, by being more inclusive about what we consider credible evidence. A number of ways we can do this. First, we can draw on and integrate the evidence that comes from multiple methods of evaluation. As Jane said, we have to match the purpose to the method of evaluation. And we also have to look at other research and at practice. A lot of you may know the uh, Chicago uh, neighborhood study that found that neighborhoods that had what they called collective efficacy had far lower crime rates than similar, than neighborhoods that were similar in income and education and employment. And this was a pretty sturdy finding, and a lot of other people found the same thing. But nobody has yet learned how to create collective efficacy in a neighborhood. What that says to me is we have to look at research that doesn't just come out of programs, but at a wide, wide array of research for guides as to what might work and what are opportunities that we should be seizing. Um, second, we should be alert to identifying the elements that characterize effective interventions that are not as easy to evaluate as programs. And here is where Jane's suggestion about field-wide learning comes in. If you can look across a bunch of initiatives and find what are the elements, what are the core elements that make the successful ones effective, then you can really inform the field. And you can also um, make sure that people, that locally grown programs are based on evidence so that you don't just have to choose from the lists of proven programs. Um, the other thing you can do when you identify these elements is you can go deeper than programs and uh, identify components that make more tangible evidence, uh, interventions effective. And a good example of that is the cultivation of trust. Um, when the Harlem Children's Zone found that their kids had five times the rate of asthma as the average around the country, they did a big asthma initiative. And they did many, many things. They had Harlem Hospital helping them with the medical part. They had, uh, the, they had Columbia helping them with the, uh, with the data collection and analysis. And they had the urban uh, studies part of Columbia helping them with the environmental part. And they went into homes and advise the families <coughs> about what to change within the homes in order to make their kids less susceptible to asthma attacks. Now, the reason they were successful in that was that they had established a trust between their organization, the Harlem Children's Zone, and the families they went to visit. And that was, they are guessing, they can't prove it, one of the key elements that made that successful. Um, a, um, a third idea for how we reconcile uh, being sure that we know what we're doing with being able to innovate. Uh, we have to find ways to generate and apply evidence in ways that encourage innovation and the cultivation of partnerships to achieve collective impact. I think the growing recognition that uh, we can't achieve most of the ends we seek with a single intervention by a single agency uh, has, is terribly important and has huge implications for, um, for 
how we evaluate. Um, you want me to take a couple minutes more? Sure. Um, I think the most striking example of success in reaching beyond individual isolated interventions comes from the country's experience in reducing tobacco use. Uh, all the people who tried single interventions were not succeeding. They didn't succeed until they combined legislation, public health program, media campaigns, and the healthcare system. And the more components that were targeted on the, really, on the clearly defined result, the better they were. Two states, California and Massachusetts, undertook the most comprehensive interventions and were able to double and then triple their annual rate of decline in tobacco consumption. And the other states paid a lot more attention to that than to the individual uh, tested interventions that appeared in peer-reviewed journals. And as I was thinking about this, I realized I'm a perfect example of this. When, um, when I became pregnant, I stopped smoking because I had read the Surgeon General's report. This is a long time ago. Everybody was smoking, right? Uh, <laughs> and I had read the Surgeon General's report that said the really devastating thing is to smoke when you're pregnant. When I had my first child, pediatrician came into the hospital room, and he took a history, and he said, do you smoke? And I said, well, I stopped when I got pregnant. He said, don't start again. And when I got home, I saw an ad on television that showed two little kids dressed up in their parents' clothes. And it said, how do children learn? They learn from their parents. Do you smoke? So they got me from all sides. I've never smoked again. <laughs> <clears throat> and my last point is that we have to use intelligence and judgments to understand and make sense of the numbers that we get. Uh, now, I um, make this point through Nate Silver, the New York Times election numbers guru. Uh, I consistently read Nate Silver before the election in order to stay at all calm. And uh, that helped me to keep my spirits up. And then it got me very interested in Nate Silver. How did he get 49 out of 50 states right uh, in 88? And how did he do it? No, 88, sorry, 2008. Uh, and how did he get all of them right this time? So I started reading his just published book and found that this numbers nerd assigned critical importance to the judgments you have to make before you can use numbers. He writes, the numbers have no way of speaking for themselves. We speak for them. We endow them with meaning. He says, when we think about how to test our ideas, we must become more comfortable with probability and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Now, that's sort of an amazing thing. Uh, in an era when data driven is so often interpreted as meaning that we can rely on the numbers alone. But Nate Silver's advice is a great fix, fit with uh, what another guru, I don't know how many of you know the work of Don Schoen, the late Don Schoen from MIT. He said, don't be taken in by what he called the nihilistic view of public affairs, that nothing can be known because the certainty we demand is unattainable. And I think that is a terribly, terribly important point when we think about the complex adaptive problems that we are dealing with. So um, my big point here is that knowing what works and why is hugely important in this era of austerity and accountability. And I'm not advocating a retreat from generating and analyzing and using rigorous evidence in decision making. I am saying that when we struggle to put together a knowledge base that will lead to effective action, we have to become much more sophisticated, much more inclusive, and less mechanistic and linear.
Thank you, Lee. So let me just, so that, because I've noticed that different segments of the room nod at different points. And so I'm <laughs> going to ask you um, to, to actually identify yourself, to say, you know, how many people in this room are grant makers? And how many are grantee organizations? And how many are evaluation professionals? And how many are just CPPP misfits? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, are you so going to correlate that with the <laughs> nodding and the shaking? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we're going to turn to Meyer Fatal. Meyer is, um, is at the Knight Foundation. Uh, there he is Director of Knowledge Management and Initiatives. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm t giving the wrong, there is VP for Strategy and Assessment. Um, and in that role, he assesses the impact of the foundation's initiatives and, and grants. Um, he strengthens their knowledge management capabilities uh, thinks of, and thinks about transparency in a foundation that was founded by, uh, by a media company. So that's a particular um, strong drive for transparency. Mayor is also originally from Zimbabwe and has worked uh, in Africa for the UN Development so I'm going to ask Mayor, uh, you know, why measure to begin with? Why evaluate to begin with? And tell us what uh, the foundation, what the Knight Foundation has learned. Sure, absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Um, just maybe with a, a quick introduction before I get into Knight's lessons, I, I think our field's embrace of evaluation tends to swing like a pendulum. You know, in some periods we really embrace it, and others we we don't want anything to do with it. Uh, I think recently we're sort of back on the upswing. You know, you take a look at some of the big foundations and it's open season for evaluators. Um, Kellogg Foundation, RWJF, Moore Foundation, Chicago Community Trust, everyone's recruiting for evaluation. So it's, it's, back in, it's back in vogue, but I think it's perceived value is often vague. So in vogue, but vague. That's kind of how I think about evaluation. Um, how, wh why, why is that? So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges. I'm going to talk about Knight's experience and, and how we've addressed some of that. In general, why do we even bother doing this stuff? At night, it's really been, uh, as many of you, I'm sure, feel the same way, doing evaluation to get good feedback, to help improve decisions, help improve program strategy. That, that's really been at the core of it. And in one of the surveys CEP did about 12 months ago, they asked foundations, you know, to what extent do you use evaluation for parts of your decision making? And nearly all of them, nearly all of those surveyed said evaluation was a, a part of their work. When they asked them, well, how useful is it? They, about 63% of them said it's really challenging to use evaluation to make decisions. So what's going on there? Uh, I think some of the big challenges, and it's been some of the lessons at night as well, we're often overambitious about what we think evaluation can deliver. And that's really a, a critical flaw in how we approach this. We assign too much to carry the evaluation forward, right? That's, that's an important part. Secondly, we often get the timing of this totally wrong. We think we can be talking about outcomes and impact very, very early on in a program, and that leads to disappointment and frustration. So there are is, there is some parts of that. The other dirty secret, I think, that often doesn't get talked about why evaluation is really hard to use is often the evaluations themselves aren't very good. Uh, and that's something we've learned the hard way at night. It's taken a team with a dedicated focus to drive the quality and detail and specificity of our pr evaluations up. Right? So that's been an important lesson. But I think the biggest lesson for us has been that the challenges with evaluation aren't necessarily always technical. They're much more <coughs> about culture and how you build a culture of reflection in an organization. Um, the big lesson is that good data doesn't necessarily lead to good decisions. Um, one of the examples I love to reference, and we often talk about this at night, is a, a study that was put together by, I think they call the Corporation for Executive Board Development. And they built something called the Insight IQ Index. And it's really designed to think about how people interpret and use data in their regular decision making as managers, as staff, as personnel. And they classified people into three buckets. The first bucket was the unquestioning empiricists. They believed in the data no matter what. You know, regardless of the uncertainty, regardless of the probability and weights assigned to it, they believed what it said. The next were those that were visceral decision makers. They believed in their gut and intuition and didn't really care what the data had to say. They knew what was right. 
And the third were informed skeptics. They understood the value of the data, but they also understood the uncertainty that goes along with it, the Nate Silvers of the world. And when they surveyed people and looked at how they make decisions and their preferences, only about a third of all managers were informed skeptics in the way they treat data. And so I think the big challenge is less a technical challenge and much more about how we use and incorporate data in our culture. So what are some of the things we've done at night to try and address this? Because we often make mistakes as many others do in this space. One of the big lessons is about information paralysis. And when you put so much in front of program teams and grantees, it's totally debilitating. And so it's a very simple lesson. People say it over and over again, but it's so important. Just collect what is actionable and what you're going to use in your decisions. The best quote, which I think really hammers this home, is a quote by a woman called Amanda Knox. Uh, and she runs the New York Times design team. And she says, data isn't like your kids. You don't have to treat them equally. <laughs> and it's a really important lesson. Just put value on the things that are most important. The second big lesson for us is that often our programs are operating in very data scarce environments um, where outcome data, impact data is very, very hard to come by uh, and very expensive and often in some cases a little bit unattainable. And so when you have boards and program staff that are pushing for tell me the results, what's the bottom line, I need to know what impact it's had it often creates a big tension between what the evaluation is able to produce, and that's where a lot of frustration comes along. One of the things we've tried to mitigate that is to put equal emphasis, not just on the results of the program, but on the improvements that are derived from the evaluation itself. And we've tried to coin this term bottom line learning, right? So that the learning and improvement is as much a contribution to your bottom line as actually knowing what the results of the programs themselves were. And I think that's just been an important interim step. And then the final thing I'll say, and this ties a little bit to the point Jane was making about external sharing of knowledge as well as kind of internally how you use evaluation. And that's the point that's often lost about evaluation, like everything in life, has to be delightful at some level, right? <laughs> it's not just good enough to be focused on utility. There has to be some delight attached to it. And so I think this really comes down to how we think about sharing knowledge. Um, and this is where I feel like we've made a lot of progress at night in the last couple of years. There is a, 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 a company called the uh, a Center for Digital Information run by a guy called Jeffrey uh, Stanger. And his point is that if you look at research and knowledge and learning in the social sector, 98% of that learning, its trajectory is into a PDF document. <laughs> uh, which is, for everything we know, not necessarily the best place to help adult learning. Uh, and we don't put, put enough emphasis on adult learning when we think about evaluation within foundations. So we've made a big effort about how you reduce the focus on the PDF, synthesize things, and break them up into really digestible pieces, and put a lot of emphasis. It sounds a little bit like the wrapping, but put a lot of emphasis on the design of these pieces. Why do you have to put emphasis on the design? Research uh, at newspapers on media consumption has for years shown that design actually confers credibility in the eyes of the reader. So people are more likely to trust what's inside it if it looks pretty, is the basic answer to that. So that's been important. The other thing we found with external audiences, when we've built out simple things like slide shares, presentations that synthesize the main findings, we've had about 5x the uptake and sharing of that material externally. Uh, and what plays externally actually often plays very well internally. So when our program teams see other people referencing this work, finding it valuable, it often then gets re-engineered and incorporated into our own work. So that's just a little bit of a, some of the highlights from our experience. Thanks so much, Mario. We're going to turn now to, to, uh, to Gabby Fitzgerald at the Foundation Center. Um, she is director of uh, knowledge management initiatives there. She was the founder of Issue Lab that many of you know, uh, which is a, uh, an open access archive for nonprofit research, which was later it was acquired by the Foundation Center. Uh, early <coughs> on in her career, she worked in nonprofits or with nonprofits as an online strategist. Uh, and in each 
each of these activities, at each uh, point in her career, her goal has been to translate information into usable knowledge rather than simply into PDF files. Um, so what we're asking Gabby to do is to talk a little bit about what this all means in practical terms, what needs to be in place in terms of, of systems and standards in order to, uh, to translate information into knowledge and share that information. Gabby. Um, hi. So yeah, you guys built up a perfect platform for this. Um, so I think a lot of the challenges that Mayur and Lee have already touched on about um, sort of the challenges in creating useful evaluation to begin with and then in how we um, sort of package and present those learnings as well. Um, you know, they're related to a larger challenge in the sector which is really around the sort of management and then mobilization of this knowledge. So, um, Foundations and nonprofits, as we well know, have this sort of treasure trove of knowledge and experience. Um, and, but few organizations, when you ask them, can actually tell you what they know. And we're even worse at this as a sector, right? So it's difficult. I mean, it, it, we're hard pressed as a sector to say, to account for or describe what we know or what we don't know about particular, not only a social problem, but then what kinds of social interventions and initiatives are actually working. Why aren't they working? What's working about Harlem Children's Zone? What isn't working about it? Why is it replicable? Why is it not? Right? I mean, we all can talk about the fact that it's good, but we can't talk a whole lot about um, why we even think it's good, right? So right now, um, and I want to build a little bit on something you said, Lee, about um, sort of the, the value of synthesis, too, right, is that Right now, evaluations, lessons learned, case studies um, are for the most part individually commissioned, um, individually funded, individually archived, and if we're lucky, they're individually shared through individual organizational websites where they're designed by individuals who have a great design sense if that organization has a design sensibility. So the sector's knowledge is highly decentralized, which I don't think in principle is a problem. But the problem is, is that we're lacking the effective linkages between those um, pieces of information, whether those are key facts or reports or PDFs for that matter, which does make up 98% of the format of the knowledge that, um, that we have access to. The problem is, is that we lack the effective linkages to essentially be able to view patterns across the sector and across this body of knowledge. Um, so as we discuss how we can design evaluations to better measure, understand, and explain the impact of our work, um, we also need to think about how we design sharing and um, how we can aggregate what we know um, in ways that allow us to begin to see those patterns. Um, so the good news is that organizations, it does, this doesn't mean that every organization now needs to become either a design expert or become um, an expert in knowledge management and mobilization in the same way that each city resident doesn't need to be personally responsible for the cleanliness of the city. What they need to be personally responsible for is moving their car on the day that it's designated for street cleaning, right? And so that's, essential, that's some of what I want to talk about is like what do we as um, foundations and as nonprofit organizations who are producing knowledge, commissioning knowledge, supporting the production of knowledge, um, what is our part in um, building and supporting an information system for the sector that we can then all um, build on? And I don't, I, I agree that um, design is a critical part of that. Um, and I think, um, I think Jeff Stanger is actually right on in a lot of ways. But the reality is, and we see this at Issue Lab and at the work that we do with Foundation Center all the time, is we have you know, 13,000 resources right now in Issue Lab, 99% of those, 99.9% .9 of those are PDFs. I mean, that's the reality of where we're at. And every single day, I have 50, 60 new PDFs coming into my email inbox. So as much as I would like to say that, you know, people should be releasing their data um, under open licenses, people should be chunking out their data um, in more usable and sort of relevant ways, I think we also, have to deal um, not only with sort of the legacy of the PDF, but also the ongoing production of the PDF. Um, and we do have ways to deal with that, and I'll touch on that um, in a moment. 
So I do, I think um, it's on some level about sort of changing, what you're saying about sort of changing an organization's culture so that it's um, a sort of healthier container for evaluation. I think um, we also have to change our expectations um, and our prioritization of sharing as something that's core to what this sector does, right? That we're a knowledge intensive sector and that we're a learning sector. We're not just, um, you know, foundations aren't just ATMs and organizations aren't just service delivery organizations. Um, and if you think, I mean, that can feel daunting, but if we think about even 15 years ago, um, you know, that there was no, ex or very little expectation that every single organization has a website and at some level publicly releases data about its finances, right? And today, that's absolutely baseline. So I think that um, it can feel like, oh my God, we need to change people's thinking about this, but I think it's already changing, and I think that um, we just need to know what it is that we're trying to do. So I wanna touch on um, some of the things, like what does that actually mean? What are the, the sort of hows of um, sharing? And, the, and it isn't, it's a combination of um, behaviors and technologies. Um, so I think the first, one of the first things that we can do um, as a sector or that any organization at any sort of resource or capacity level can do is to really think about the role of um, centralized repositories and clearing houses. I think they're often overlooked in the same way that public libraries are sort of taken for granted. Um, you know, they're a little old fashioned and strange and um, you know, we could talk about whether information actually needs to be centralized and I don't think it does. But I do think that repositories and clearinghouses play a very specific role in the infrastructure that we need to pay attention to. Um, you know, as a person who manages one of those, um, I can tell you that there are important things that we do that know, sort of in the same way that the streets and sanitation folks take care of things that we don't want to take care of or can't take care of. Um, information clearinghouses and archives do a couple of really important things. The first thing is that we actually index resources with clear metadata. So meaning we literally sort out, you know, who published, the difference between who published a report from who funded that report, who authored that report, who holds the copyright over that report, what the actual title is, what the date is, things that, I mean, it is mind boggling the number of reports we get with no date, no copyright, no author, you know, 27 organizations on the front of it. So, that's fine, like that can be as messy and dirty as it needs to be as long as there's somebody in the sector whose role it is to say, okay, let's sort these things out so that we can begin to build those linkages that we're talking about. Um, so that means we can look at who co-authored something. You know, we can look at the history of a funder's involvement around a particular um, issue and an understanding of that issue. The same things we expect out of something like academic literature, we should expect out of our own literature. I mean, we should value it enough that we actually say, you know what, I should be able to do a literature review. It's not acceptable for me to spend three weeks and have an intern spend three weeks digging through thousands of websites to find out what we know. Um, the other thing and the importance of um, some of these data standards is that um, organizations like ours, what we do is that we actually then translate those standards and, and build crosswalks to the standards of other cataloging systems. So something like WorldCat, that's actually a global cataloging system, ties into literally tens of thousands of public libraries. Um, so that metadata work, although sort of granular and slightly boring, is really critical to making sure that the Knight found, what the Knight Foundation is learning in the field is actually ending up accessible to people who are going into the public library and trying to find out how to start an initiative in their local community. So that's where we're talking about sort of literally the infrastructure of, of the sector's information system. Um, and the other piece is an archiving piece. So we see organizations, you know, you change your website, you're like, oh yeah, anything prior to 1990, all of a sudden we're taking that off the site. Um, you know, or we moved it all over to a publication section and changed all the URLs, or for that matter, organizations close their doors, and that knowledge, again, is just not findable and accessible any longer. And so that's another really key role for, for centralized repositories. Um, the second suggestion, and the second sort of um, how of this process is something that, that's more directed sort of to um, probably those of you who work at foundations, 
But to begin to think about designing, designing or redesigning grant making protocols in ways that prioritize sharing. So, um, you know, NIH for years and years, every research grant that's given through NIH, the resulting research has to end up in PubMed. And, you know, again, that can seem sort of like, you know, who cares? Well, a lot of people care, and it's critical to understanding, you know, historically what we're learning and being able to do the kind of synthesis that Lee's describing. Um, so that's something that at the level of a grant making protocol is something I encourage you all to start thinking about. What does it, you know, we do, we ask things like, what is your dissemination strategy, right? Or what's your communication strategy? And someone, you know, and you write back and say, you know, we'll be allocating X dollars to, you know, these things and we'll be sharing it with our network. And those are all really important strategies, but they don't get to this underlying piece. And so one of those things is to, to begin to think about what would you as grant makers want to perhaps require or encourage your grantees to do? Um, and how can they contribute to sharing? A piece of that is also, and I, and I know Mayur may have something to add to this as well, but a piece of that is to consider the role of licensing in that grant making protocol too. So when you're commissioning research or you're funding research, um, what kind of license are you asking um, the researchers and the publishing organizations to apply to their research? So, um, you know, there, there's been a lot of change and a lot of progress around this question of licensing, um, you know, especially with under sort of the leadership of organizations like Creative Commons. Um, we're not asking that people give away their, their intellectual property, um, but that you literally be more intentional and purposeful about clarifying how that information can get used so that it can be get, so it can get used. I mean, we're not evaluating or producing knowledge in order to stick it in our own archives and be proud of ourselves. You know, we're creating it in order to deepen impact and in order to inform the field. And licensing actually plays a role in that. Um, so you can say, you know what, this gets, you know, we, again, we get tons of research into Issue Lab that says, all rights reserved, contact us if you want to use it. I mean, it's completely unrealistic. It's like people, an advocate finds that piece of research, they want to be able to use it, they want to be able to photocopy it, maybe they want to use it in a class, and they're unnecessarily restricted from doing that. And open licensing and Creative Commons licenses allow you to actually be very clear about how you want that work to be repurposed, but with the idea that it should be repurposed. So I think those, those two things are things that we can begin to think about making part of our grant making protocols as a way to contribute to this um, larger effort of sharing. Um, another thing that I do um, want to just mention because we talked about both this question of, um, of, what, of actionable knowledge and also synthesis, um, something that, that we've begun work on is because we're dealing with this many PDFs, how can we start to use existing technologies, text mining technologies, natural language processing technologies, to actually begin to extract the findings that are really buried in what's largely unstructured data at this point, right? It's these thousands and thousands of reports that one report calls it key findings, the next report calls it what we learned, the next report calls it, you know, if we could tell you what we know. I mean, it's just all over the map, which is, again, fine and is sort of, you know, the beauty of the knowledge, this, this body of gray literature. But we do have the technologies to begin to say, um, you know, what are, what are the patterns we're seeing and how can we chunk out some of these learnings so that we could begin to do, um, you know, a comparison, a meta-analysis across 20, 30, 200 reports on the value of after school time, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's no need to make this an $80,000 synthesis project. Um, you know, I mean, that's just my opinion. <laughs> but, um, and then I think the last thing um, is just that not only do we need, um, do we need to sort of Im improve our own practices or, or perspectives on the, the value of evaluation, but also start to think about um, how we evaluate our knowledge sharing strategies too, right? So we produce a ton of research with the idea that it changes practices or the idea that it um, makes people think differently about an issue, but we don't really know that. And we don't, 
um, we don't have very great measures of it. So we get stuck on things like the number of downloads um, or the number of visits to my website as a measure of whether it was a good thing to create that research to begin with, which is maddening. I mean, it is not, it's like here's the measure and here's what we're trying to measure. They have nothing to do with each other. Um, and so that, there are increasingly things like digital object identifiers that are kind of like an ISBN number um, that are saying, you know what, let's all use one link when we link to, to this particular paper. So we can begin to look at things like citations um, as one sort of proxy measure, but a little bit closer than did anybody come to my website. So I throw, I know I just threw a bunch of different things out there, but I want mostly um, to sort of communicate that that there is, there's a lot happening in this field, right? There's a lot happening in sort of understanding how we can better share. Um, and there's people doing it um, and who are in the right role to do it. But I think we all actually have a role to play in it and have to start making it part of our thinking about evaluation, too. Is not, if we really are learning, then how can we share, share that learning um, with, a, with a broader group of people and across the sector, across organizations? So. That's where my brain is at. Thank you. We've got half an hour uh, for discussion. Um, you've, you've heard about the how, how, the why, and for what purpose. Um, please do shoot your questions at our panelists. And tell us whether you're an empiricist, a visceral <laughs> 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 something, or a, um, or a skeptic. <laughs> <laughs> questions, comments. Um, I think that that your discussion on evaluation is wonderful, but when it gets down to the nitty gritty, we're checking out grants. We're looking at things like how many kids that you serve finish high school and go to college. I mean, we're looking at really basic numbers. Um, at uh, Weingart Foundation, we tried to do look for programs in the inner city because we say we serve poor people. Aren't any? Well, why are there not any? Well, because. Our evaluation process showed that our track record in the inner city is not very good. So we don't put programs there because we can't get funding. Mm -hmm. So our evaluation process has come full circle. We are now shooting ourselves in the foot so that we are not funding anything in the inner city. Um, it seems like we need a new kind of theoretical response to the data that we're getting to be able to at least step back and say, well, the track record isn't going to be that good, but we need to fund it anyway. This seems like a lead question. Yeah. Uh, I heard yesterday somebody say uh, there are programs that we don't do, not because we're afraid we can't get results, but we don't do them because we're afraid we can't measure them. That's, that's another impediment. And I must say that listening to this panel uh, it's all, it's music to my ears, what we're saying here. And coming from Washington, it does not seem to be part of the real world. And the real world is what you're talking about, where you are asked for results that are hard to get, either because it's hard to measure them or because the results themselves take a long time. They like take more intensive efforts than, than have been uh, have been typical. Uh, they take a higher dosage. They take much much more talented staff. So while you're talking about the world as it should be, we know it's not like that. And the question I want to pose is. What are we doing to make the world safer for high risk, difficult to assess, and difficult to get results in the short term? What is this community doing about that? So, I'm sorry, I didn't answer so your Mayor, question. I asked it, it, Mayor, to ground it in a foundation, though, if you would, mm -hmm. Mayor. Would, uh, how do you deal with venturing into the unproven? Mm -hmm. when it, yeah, I mean, I think I'll come to your question as well. But on, on this one, in our journalism and media innovation work, by its very title, um, it's venturing into the unproven very often. Uh, I think your question is really when you know you're in uncertain territory or when the, the outcomes are stacked up against you, 
how do you employ evaluation effectively in those environments? Um, and in our case, we've been very, very careful to say, for these projects that we're supporting that are focused on new startups, uh, new media innovation startups, we're not going to use evaluation to, to, be, to make a hard and fast judgment about their success. We're going to use it to help inform their adoption and their progress. I guess that's how but we... But not everybody is free to do that. No, I totally I mean, appreciate if that. You, if yeah. you want to partner with a federal agency, yes. yep. you're not free to do that. Nope. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you can't get away from the pressures that I've been talking about. And um, you, you're in a very luxurious mm -hmm. situation where you can say, okay, we're calling this something else, we're calling this innovation, and you don't have to show that you get results. Not every, now, the, the, the SIF projects, for example, they have to be able to show not only that what they're trying to do has been proven in the past, but that they have a mechanism to prove it, not to learn from it, to prove it in the future. Now that, and I, I, I was wondering about my, your, your, uh, your pendulum analysis. I think it's not so much a pendulum at this very moment. Well, I guess pendulums do and will swing back. <laughs> but at the moment, the pendulum for federal money and for a lot of public money is at a very extreme yes. end. Mm -hmm. yep. And I guess I do agree with your pension. <laughs> <laughs> and Wait a I want to know, what are we going to do to bring it back to a yeah. more constructive place where you, if you want to go into an inner city neighborhood and do something that is promising but not proven, and where your results are not going to be stellar in the first few years, how are you not only not prevented from doing it, how are you encouraged to do that? So this is, is really all about risk. And I think it's interesting. <laughs> from a funder standpoint, I would do something in the inner city. I'm not going to do it. The public charity is going to do it. I'm going to give a grant to a public charity. Right. And public charities are not there because everyone else said, well, your track record in your city is bad that you won't give me funding. So there is no platform for me as a funder. <coughs> and that's exactly where I was going to go, Good is point. to think about what mm -hmm. foundations signal to the social yeah. sector broadly in their reliance on mm -hmm. uh, evaluation and certain kinds of evaluation. Um, Hugh, and then, and then we're going to go right back there. So it seems to me one of the challenges that we were wrestling with is that we're bucking up against a pretty significant cultural response. Right? One of the reasons that the feds are doing what they're doing is because there's, a, there's such a low level of trust. And it's about trust of public money. We're, there's a conversation going on now, we heard earlier this week, about social impact investing, which at its heart means how do we attract more capital than public sector money that's going to be driven by results that are at least measurable. Um, so that they are confident that the money is being put. And, and to me, I think this whole evaluation issue, it's a confidence issue. Right? So you either take the, the, the risk element and say, we just have a whole different set of standards, right? or this, this uh, I think, multiple decade long process of bringing evaluation into every element, because we can count it, because we have public money to us, because my private money because we live in a market environment, that's how we measure success. So it seems to me the challenge that you're offering is how do you buck that trend, which is, is pretty hard, uh, because we actually have a pretty low uh, ROI threshold, because there isn't enough money to try. I mean, there is lots of money, but, but we don't trust that we've got money to throw around. We want to see the trust. And I think that's sort of the larger cultural element, we're all trying to prove that we're good stewards, we're all trying to prove that the money makes sense and the project makes sense, and without getting it, you can do it. I just want to say that I think 
I think you're right about this sort of trust and credibility piece, right? And but I wonder. It takes me back to what you were saying, Lee, about not not needing to know something perfectly in order to say this is valid, right? And so that's where I come back to feeling like if we could lean more heavily on our collective intelligence mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than on my foundation doesn't have knowledge about X, right? Or this individual assessment didn't prove it didn't reach the level of rigor or reliability or validity mm -hmm. by you know scientific standards, but what do we know collectively over time mm -hmm. and begin to get the, that credibility that you're talking about and that trust out of, like the sector has been working on these things, right? Beyond, not yeah. just yeah. me or yeah. this person or this scientist, but so I, I, I hear what you're saying. I see the challenge in that, but I feel like that's, that's sort of what we got on some level too, right? Um, <clears throat> I think that, that what we're seeing is that part of the field needs to be focusing on this extreme innovation, this place where breakthroughs are, are able to happen. And I'm just really curious if, if any of you have seen examples of really great processes that enable breakthroughs to happen, where we're ch our assumptions are being kind of shattered, where we're realizing how blind we were. And <clears throat> I think part of that as a person really into networks is seeing you know, who, it's the who. Who is part of this evaluative breakthrough process? And you know, too often I think it's like the foundation's off evaluating by itself and the people who've actually been involved and the people on the street, the people who are being helped, supposedly, aren't really part of that extreme evaluative kind of process where they can actually, you know, push foundation folks in the face and say, hey, wait a minute, here's what's really happening. Don't you realize this is what's going on? And then that kind of process can enable people to make these tremendous breakthroughs that then allow the next step to be designed in a in really different way because they're thinking all of a sudden, you know, the lights are going off and they're thinking about things. So, so more than one topic in that. I mean, the whole question yeah. of co-designing uh, of, of beneficiary feedback but also, um, what does evaluation do to innovation? Does it yeah. does it mm -hmm. squeeze it out? So. Go. Should we start? Maybe I'll take the the second of the two questions. What the role of evaluation in innovation? I think I think you're actually touching on something that's very very critical, which is often when we are using the term evaluation and employing it around innovative enterprises or practices we're often focused on the unit of the intervention itself and don't do enough work in employing evaluation to help identify the unmet needs, the compensating behaviors. And it's partly because of where we train the spotlight in the evaluation. We're told to be, you know, define all the questions up front, be specific, you know, work out what you're going to do. And I think part of it is allowing for ambiguity in the evaluation as a discovery process. Because that's, that's, been a, that's something we don't always do very well at the foundation. Uh, but I think that's a, a key part of it. And I'd like to respond to your extreme evaluation notion. I think there are circles in which any innovation is considered extreme, right? <laughs> and if, if you can only get money if what you're doing has been proven, then an innovation turns out to be extreme. Yeah. I would hope that the hotbed of funding for extreme evaluations is right here in this room. Because it certainly isn't where I live in Washington. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that those of you who are much more imaginative about what counts as impact and how you get it would be the ones that could fund those innovations where we're going to get a large part of our breakthrough impact. Because simply scaling what has worked in the past, which is sort of the, the, the fad of the day, is not going to get us to the breakthrough impact. But isn't that why collaborations with the feds are so important that you can actually re-educate, people can engage, they can look over your shoulders on your more radical kinds of programs 
and begin to see. I don't think we we have a good argument to say that this extreme innovation is really where we need to go. We don't have enough case studies. We don't have enough, uh, you know, articulation of what that looks like. What happens, you know, when you operate in this very engaged. So what I'm do, the one I'm going to do though is take that comment, take two more, and then return to you okay. because we only have 15 minutes to go. Um, so I would take. In fact, three together. Paul Washington's been much maligned, so you, uh, we want to comment from you, James, and then you. And there was a third over here. Yes, get from you. So, Paul, start us off. Did, didn't you have your hand up at some point? Uh, I did not, but I you should have. <laughs> you should have. <laughs> There's a lot to say. <laughs> so I would be happy to share a thought on this. I think. Uh, you know, as unaccustomed as I am to defending the government in this particular instance, um, I, I think that we have to recognize that, that you know, if, if you're in a situation that, that, that there are all sorts of challenges we have related to evaluation and all sorts of challenges that we face uh, individually and collectively in terms of trying to drive forward uh, things that are effective and uh, dedicate resources to those relative to things that are not. Uh, the government is undergoing its its own evolution in that process um, in consistent with the comments that uh, Lee especially started I think the Obama administration deserved I was director of the social innovation fund for you know three and a half to two and a half years uh, and so the social innovation fund was actually created in large part to advance you know one aspect of, of the evaluation and is absolutely created in this you know, scale of worse context uh, so the Obama administration, I think, deserves a lot of credit for recognizing the importance of innovation and in trying to increase its use. But we have all sorts of different problems. One problem is that the government, as well as a lot of foundations, have dedicated over many years billions of dollars to individual discrete innovations based on no evidence of effectiveness and have continued to fund them without any indication that they work or improve people's lives, sometimes we're uh, facing, leading to situations where subsequent studies have indicated that not only did they not work, they were counterproductive. Okay. So, so, you know, we can, among the problems that we face, one problem is that even where we have um, interventions that, that do add value, disproportionately, funders are not dedicating resources to those as opposed to interventions that either have no evidence or have evidence of not even uh, contributing to people's lives. Okay, now, many government actions now are focused on addressing that problem, and the Social Innovation Fund is one of them. So we have a, a threshold requirement for evidence before you can even qualify. It's not incredible, it's not RCT, but you have to have some evidence that this intervention actually affects people's lives. And then you have to commit to engaging in processes that improve the evidence around that. So that's that's a you know that's a pretty kind of sensible thing, but it's not it's not going to be transformative in the sense of some where this conversation has gone most recently. But I think I'd be very interested in seeing anybody who would disagree with the idea that the government should you know where it's going to be dedicating public money should favor programs that actually have some evidence of working with all the limitations that have been implied in this conversation, as opposed to dedicating resources to things that have no evidence. But no doubt about it, that's not the same thing as swinging for the fences. You know, I mean, that's a, that's a whole different thing. Right, right, and as we think about the sectors and what, you know, what, what, what sort of accountability is required of each, um, the public sector is in a very different situation than the philanthropic sector in this regard. I would also to just real quickly on that too, that the, that the government is really struggling with this, and so what we get a lot of signals from OMB, and even the, the you know, interestingly enough, even the SIF is like not worthy to OMB. And so in some instances, you might think like this is like radical, crazy, like perhaps it's it's extreme. Crazy. But but even the you know, OMB is really struggling right. to sort of all of these issues. Right. Uh, I'm going to take James's question, and then I'm going to turn to the panel. Fortunately, you can stay away from the federal government. But just in terms of maybe talking to those of us that are you know, more localized, more micro-programmatic, looking for evaluation, looking for you know, how we justify, how we move 
board with the programs. In listening to the discussion, some of the things that I, I've heard is, or synthesizing myself, is that we back end a lot of this instead of doing the work that's needed up front with the organization. Um, you know, a lot of us in the room work with very small organizations who don't have the slightest idea what to do in terms of data collection, data synthesis, and yet we expect them to do it. And then I go in there saying, I need this, this, and this. And another funder says, well, we need to measure this, this, and this. And maybe we need, and maybe the organizations need to convene us together and say, what, as a whole, do you guys want us to do? And what, and what is realistic for us? And then sort of manage our expectations and what we can expect. I just have to throw in. I, I once had a situation with the Global Philanthropy Forum that one funder said, we'll give you $50,000 to have McKinsey do a, McKinsey would do a pro bono review, uh, evaluation. And the other funder who was involved said, exactly right, rely on that guy's $50,000, but it's got to be Bain. We don't like McKinsey. <laughs> <laughs> so these kinds of things do happen. Before we turn to you, I think what we'll do, actually, why don't we just throw your question in as well, and then we'll turn to the just, you know, because I'm a, I run a, a multi-service poverty relief agency kind of on the ground working with, frankly, the poorest of the poor. And there are a lot of challenges in collecting data from people who are largely immigrants, largely uneducated, and so on, and, and just overwhelmed by life. Um, so so I, I guess sometimes it's the quality of the, the data. We do a lot of measurements in our clinic, for example, of diabetic patients, their glucose levels from the time they start our education and treatment program to the end to see if they're improving, that kind of stuff. In our ESL program, we, you know, we do, we used to do the standard pre and post test. And then it, it became apparent so that we could show our funders, our funders, <laughs> that our students were running it. But then a lot of our students don't like to be tested, so they just didn't show up the last week of class because they didn't want to be tested. So, okay, so we had to kind of rethink, okay, how are we evaluating the traditional methods of, you know, the work, you know, with our pop? So how are we finding out whether our students are really learning or not? So we've got a whole different approach around that. But, but to speak to, and, and I guess part of it is what our foundation's looking for from agencies like ours who don't have a lot of resources to put into that whole evaluation piece. But, but also that quality of data, the most striking example to me, we, we partner in the Family Source Center program in Pacoima, where we're located. And so we have this wraparound service. We're, we're a subcontractor, so we didn't do any, we weren't involved at all in setting the parameters <coughs> of this program. But we have to measure, we were told up front, we have to measure outcomes. I thought, that's great. We need to show what we're doing. So um, as we've gotten into this program, you know, it, we have to practically stand on our heads to get these outcomes. But as an example, we have to show not only that we signed up people for food stamps, but they have to come back and show us the paperwork that they were approved. Now, to get them to come back, means that we have to call them up multiple times and then say, we'll give you a gift card if you come back. We'll give you an extra food box if you come back. We'll, all these things. A lot of time, we have volunteers that do those calls. Who time makes you get those outcomes? The, the, the government agency that funds our, our lead contract. But what, I, what floored me was when I found out from our staff, now we've been into it a couple of years, and I asked our staff, OK, so all these families in this family source program, they're getting all these wraparound services. We're showing these at them. Are their lives any better? And the measurements that they're doing is how many people have shown us the paperwork on food stamps, how many people have shown us their paperwork on low cost auto insurance, how many, how many. But nobody's asking the question, are, they, are their lives getting better? Are they moving out of poverty? So we now have a social work intern who's volunteering with us who's calling back these clients to find out, is this making any difference whatsoever? Uh, I mean, it, to me, it's almost laughable to say, you know, we've got these, this data, but it doesn't really show us any improvement on people's life if they're moving out of poverty or not. So, uh, so I guess, uh, you know, from a, from a provider's point of view, I guess I'm wondering what foundations are really looking for in terms of that. So, <clears throat> you guys have the job of answering the following questions. <laughs> How to make sure you get the questions right. What are the unintended consequences, negative consequences of evaluation? Um, who bears the burden and, and how? Um, when is evaluation and the search for certainty the enemy of impact? Uh, and then finally, what role of different, uh, of grant, different sectors in the grant making sphere? You, and you've got four minutes to do it. <laughs> <laughs> actually, two, actually right? you've got six, so you're, 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 
you're doing fine. I'm going to start with you, Gabby, and move right this down. This is among the three of us. Yes. Perhaps. I'm okay. going to. So you get to choose I'm your. Gonna hand the baton, actually. I mean, I don't. <laughs> You know, it's making me think about, um, I mean, this last question actually is making me think about, um, you know, I, I'm not an evaluator. And so what I do is that I see, I mean, it's some of what you were saying, Lee, about Nate Silver, right? So I see tons of this come across my desk. And so I have the privilege of being able to see, oh, you know what, you're not the only person trying to answer this question. And so then I think about a social work intern calling all those people back. When there's actually research out there about sort of, what does the data that you already have mean in a larger context, right? What do we know about the relationship between yes. poverty relief and um, food stamp support, right? So it's like those answers are actually out there. And I don't know that, that putting the work of going back and asking the question, is your life better, or whatever additional data point you're trying to collect is necessarily the strategy either. And so maybe some of this is about you know, creating evaluations that have richer context rather than just more data. And so, you know, they, they were built inside a data context. I mean, at this point, we have so much data as a sector and across sectors. Um, I think the real struggle is what do we, how do we make meaning out of that data? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think um, we need to support that skill development in the sector, frankly, um, and need to support that capacity because that's a real I think we're only just scratching the surface of that problem in the next you know if we go to one more conference on big data you know it'll make me just want to scream because it's like okay but what do we do with all that data and I think we're coming up against exactly that like that data exists out there it's a matter of accessing and making sense of it so that's sort of that's the thing that's my one response to that. And I was just question. about to invite you to a conference on big data. Why don't I take this question, which is really about the relationships between foundations and nonprofits when it comes to thinking about implementing evaluation. There's a, I'm going to cite CEP again. They just put out a, a great study called Demystifying Nonprofit Complacency when it comes to thinking about evaluation and assessment. And they show that you know, over 80% of the nonprofits they surveyed, and it was a fairly decent cohort, uh, all believe in evaluation, all want it, and are trying to incorporate it. But when they ask them about their relationship with their funder when it comes to evaluation, 30% say they get funded to do some of the evaluation work. So there's more than 70% don't get any support. And then another 30% say it's helpful the support we get from our foundation. So I think part of it is if we really are going to, we're going to go back to the pendulum, if it really is swinging on the upside, we've got to build the capacity of nonprofits, not just internally at the foundation. Um, so that would be my response on that one. Lee. I think that the issue of why should we do innovations at all? Why couldn't we just stick with implementing what we know is a very fundamental question. And if we are satisfied with the impacts that we're getting, then we don't have to worry about these extreme innovations. If, on the other hand, we realize that we have made so little progress on reducing the race and income-based uh, uh, um, differences in health, education, employability. If we realize that most of the things that we're working toward, we haven't gotten very far in the last 50 years. In the last 50 years, the death from, um, from juvenile leukemia has gone from 90% to 2%. We're not doing that in the social fields that we're working on, which means, I believe, that we have to, ha we have to find transformative interventions. Those are the hardest to measure, the hardest to mount, the hardest to prove the efficacy of. And that's why we need this sector that can afford to take risks. I think you can afford to take I hope you can afford to take risks. 
to show the way to become very smart about how we measure results and to be able to take the risks that will get us to the breakthrough impacts that we need. So I, I think that's the perfect close. I mean, it's extraordinary, <laughs> extraordinary to be part of a sector that can take risks. So please thank you.